So welcome as the last speaker from my side. What I'm going to tell you in the next 15 minutes, and if you don't have questions, it's going to be 20, um, is about our new HPC system um, that we have at BSF. And it is named Curiosity, as you can see on the image that has been taken a couple of days ago. So before I'm starting here, I would like to tell you something about BSF. Who is BSF? So BSF is all about chemistry. It's also reflected in our uh, slogan, which says, we create chemistry. Um, so what we are active in as business is determined by the needs of the world, which might sound a little bit large, but actually chemistry materials is almost everywhere. Uh, even if you're having something digitalized, you need materials that are transporting all those bits. And you see here a couple of challenges that our uh, population, our society is facing, and BSF is active in uh, all of those fields. And I'm not going through all of that. Um, I have a second slide which shows a little bit what are the, the business areas BSF is in. So it's, it's really not much about providing chemicals, it's rather about providing solutions. And I always say that, say that try to sit in any car manufactured by a German car or a European car manufacturer and not touch BSF materials. You would to hover in the car. So that's, it's impossible. So this is the current slide as of 2017. If you would have asked me a couple of years ago, this slide might have looked different. That's what I'm going to show you in the next one. So BSF is known in IT. We actually, we've been the first with big data, you know it. So it's a two times two times two meter cube, which holds an incredible number of 60 megabytes, which was produced for the IBM 360 like a half a century ago. So I found this in a museum in the hometown of my mother. And since this is a storage audience, I would like to share that with you. Um, you see those plates in here. It's that diameter, and you could have like a cake, and they have this, this uh, top on it. It's really the same. It looks the same like at home what you have to, to, to shield the cake from whatever wants to land on it. So yeah, it's, you, it's on display in Hungary in, in the uh, museum, and you can go there. They have really, really lots of old stuff. So obviously, this product is not on sale anymore. No one wants to get this. Uh, it's the same with floppy and tapes. No one's going to buy that, and that's why we don't sell it anymore. If you want to get something and you really come with a lot of money, we might revamp this product line. Um, but up to now, we're not going to do it. On the contrary, what we're going to do is currently, um, we want to improve our research process. It's with digitalization, there are so, so um, there are really tremendous opportunities in uh, getting your things done faster that um, we don't want to miss out on that. Um, so that's one of the opportunities. And on a long run, you can imagine that if you don't stay competitive with your research and development cycle, at some point in time, it's going to be hard to be on the market competitive. So what this slide shows you is a very high level uh, process on how you would like to develop a new pr uh, product. Usually, you don't start from scratch, like uh, you don't have any knowledge and want to make a new product. You start from pre-existent knowledge, and then from that, you have an application profile, which means nothing else than what a customer demands. So. The customer usually has, usually has a very clear demand on what the material or a solution should look like. And then this makes a data flow, uh, an application profile. So based on that customer demand, you start out with, uh, to develop a model. And that's on the right upper hand side of, of my slides there. And to generate such a model, you don't do this by pen and paper. We have some examples where we did it with pen and paper. So we have really genius physicists that do that, but that's not applicable to most of the uh, problems. So what you do then is you need to solve an incredible amount of uh, um, equations, and that turns you into HPC. Now, what comes out of such a model is uh, lots of data, and this data needs to be 
interpreted and it needs to be interpreted in a way that you tell a chemist what is beneficial to do in a lab. And that's the next step. That's a design of experiment, which is simply a mathematical way to improve on this incredible intuition that chemists have. Uh, and you want to beat them, which is not that easy. I'm a chemist too, so I understand that. It's not easy to do that. Um, and based on this design of experiments, you're going to do the lab experiments. So those are really expensive ones. And you don't have like a zillion people that can do 100 million experiments in a year. So you have quite a few, and you can do one lab experiment per day, just a rough number. So based on these lab experiments, you're going to produce a sample. And this sample needs to be analyzed because it's sitting there. It has a nice color, but you don't know whether the customer likes it or not. So you're going to do some tests on that. And that's on the left-hand side, which is the application testing shown here in, uh, in corporate yellow, I would say. Um, and based whether the customer would be satisfied, which usually is not the case on the first cycle, you have to redo this entire cycle. So if you mean this seriously, it means you need a lot of people, you need a lot of skilled people, and you need a lot of computing power. And just to give you an example of what BSF is doing here, um, we're starting out in, in quantum chemistry where we really care about the electrons and the chemistry that's going on. And I feel very safe on that side. Um, and then whenever you also move along the value chain, you're moving to, to the right, which brings you in completely different uh, areas of simulation. And on, on the right-hand side, you don't talk about chemistry anymore. It's more about material properties and how uh, properties are determined by the chemistry. So having realized that, um, BSF decided to have a supercomputer uh, that is able to uh, fulfill or satisfy the needs that we have in terms of computational uh, demand. So th the system is, I mean, that's industry. It's going to have not like running one job, an entire system, and when it's done, it's going to get the next one. So we have, we have a horrible workload, which means we have way too many serial jobs because the software we're using that is good sucks at computation. So it's, it's running efficiently single core, single thread. Um, but you're going to do a hundred thousands of them as a turnaround. And on the other hand, you're going to have large jobs that are addressing the, the really big questions where you're gaining insight on, on a more basic level that would enable you in the long run to come up with a really new product. So these disruptive technologies where you need to understand what your chemistry is all about. So that's the design of the system. You've seen pictures of the system throughout the presentation here. Is, um, that's been Apollo 6000 Gen 10 by HPE. And it's, it's been the first one that came off out of the Houston factory uh, and I used to say that's been very good uh, project management to get that out like three weeks before uh, Harvey struck Houston. Uh, otherwise, we would have to fight the alligators uh, on the production floor. Um, so me, personally, me hit this when I saw all the pictures. And um, the, the system is an 888-node system, which is a nice number. I can easily remember that. Uh, wasn't on purpose, but turned out to be a really good number to, to keep up with. Um, we have uh, Intel Xeon uh, system scalable framework, uh, Gold 6148 CPU is the official naming, um, which is 20 core CPU at 2.4 gigahertz. And that's been part of the early shipment program uh, of Intel and one of the three systems with the Skylakes to enter the top 500 list in June. And our system ranked at number 65. Um, in, in the list, uh, let's see what's going to be in, in the next list. Um, we chose the Omnipass interconnect here uh, because from the system size, you know, these 888 nodes puts you in a sweet spot where when you want to have a really a non-blocking fabric that can be done because of the 48 Radix and those uh, chassis you see here, they have 24 nodes, which makes it kind of easy. Uh, to set up a fabric here. It was a two-layer fat tree. We also 
had or have some special notes with C on Phi and GPUs in there. Um, I intended them to be some kind of sandbox when we signed the contract, but it's been a year ago, and um, you know, world turns around. So people are really keen on them. So they, they don't care about the big system. So it's really like they want to have, give me the Xeon files, give me GPUs, when can I have it, when can I have it, yeah? Man, you have so much computing power there. Why you want to have these small CV GPU systems? Um, but that's the way it is. The world is changing. And we have an Intel software stack there um, with the Intel uh, compiler and MPI. And of course, we have storage. And I put this uh, last because that's going to be, not because it's the least of all, but it's going to be the next slide. Uh, what we have there, and I would like to share some of the uh, system details here, and it's an SF14KX, and we're using GPFS. So why are we going for GPFS? It's very simple. We have a couple of years on uh, multiple GPFS systems that we have experience with. No one ever worked with Lustre and BSF, and we are not an academic inside, so you never get money for doing a research project and how to keep a cluster into production mode without anyone knowing how to handle a file system, so it doesn't work. So GPFS has been good. Uh, we have actually two racks. You've seen the design, two rows, very uh, uh, symmetric. And it's like 650 uh, hard disks in there and uh, SSDs for the metadata. So pretty, I would say, pretty straightforward setup. Of course, uh, OmniPass uh, interface here uh, because the cluster has OPA. And um, then the tricky thing is you can buy that you get the system there, but then how are you going to configure that? And we had did kind of an uh, interesting investigation together with the uh, DDN guys, and uh, I've seen a similar graph on the next, last presentation. So we have very same story that we can have 400 million files, and out of those 400 million files, 399 something files are less than, let's say, one megabyte in size. So what we decided is to go with a smaller block size because all of our files are good. It just fits, and we lose a little bit on the performance, but that's not too much. And uh, you see here that with this four meg block size, the entire system can deliver 43 gigabytes of um, aggregated bandwidth, which is really cool for the system. Um, if you go to eight, it's going to be 60, and I think if you go with a very large block size, we didn't run the performance test, you would be in excess of 100 gigabytes per second here. And what we do, and that's also kind of a feature why we have GPFS, you do the snapshots, because I don't want to handle a lot of tickets where users say, I want to restore that file. You go just there in the snapshot director and restore whatever you, uh, for whatever reason, lost. And that's nice um, for backup, back in time recovery. So BSF is a chemical company. So it, in the unlikely case, something is going to happen. And in the last 150 years, two, thing, two times we had uh, an incident on the site which essentially blew up a significant area. So you want to have kind of recovery system. Um, so what we're going to do is set up an AFM uh, cash for disaster recovery. We are, uh, so I, I learned in the, the previous talk that there are some issues, but we are not going to write on the copy, so it's just getting data across the other side, having the data there. So um, that will be implemented in the next couple of weeks. With that being said, uh, here's my final slide. If you are interested in more information about the system, uh, that's the official URL. We have a couple of press releases. We have a couple of image uh, videos on YouTube. Just Google for curiosity with Q, which is, you will find it. There are not so many legasthenics outside. Uh, the Q is because that's kind of our trademark. Make a K sound, a Q. That's for our digitalization department, so that's on purpose. And there will be a full story of the system uh, out uh, right before Christmas. When I return, we're going to write a scorebook uh, and finalize that. So if you're interested, have a look uh, at the video. It's going to tell you a little bit on what we're doing there. And with that, I reach the end of my presentation. I'm open for questions. 
Thank you, Stefan. Uh, any questions? Yes, we've got a question over here. The system is physically located in Germany, in our, at our headquarters in Ludwigshafen site, and uh, the exact position I'm not going to disclose. <laughs> High value assets, you know what I'm talking about. It's, I mean, it's, it's our major site, 35,000 employees, two uh, power plants, and cooling, whatever you want. So it's an industrial complex. There's another question from a random audience member. Why did you pick DDN for GPFS over IBM? Um, so GPFS has been one of the very few things that we put in as we want to have it. Um, why did we pick DDN? So we talked with DDN guys beforehand. We didn't explicitly ask for DDN, but uh, I would like to share that, that all of the vendors that we asked to make a proposal came up with DDN, with one exception. Um, so it's been kind of consistent market <laughs> share that you have there. So Thank you, yes. Thank you. The reason.